Um, so I've organized this talk into three sections. The first section is sort of what are we talking about? What are these two models? Um, the second section is why is the ecological model better? Um, and the third section is what are some examples that we might explore? And um, again, I'm talking about um, tribal co-management agreements in the United States. So I'm focusing mostly on um, United States domestic law. And these are legal, I should say legal models, not economic models. Um, so the jurisdictional model, uh, this is the existing dominant model, which um, Dr. Durrani's slide actually with the boxes of the natural resources, you know, the oil and gas and the water, and that's very much um, a visual depiction of the jurisdictional model. So this involves making natural resource management decisions within the jurisdictional framework imposed by the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court has sort of laid out this constitutional framework that says the federal government is responsible for these aspects of natural resources, the states are responsible for these aspects, and then the tribes have certain input um, along the way. So in a given um, system, there might be, like in a river system, for example, there might be concurrent federal and state jurisdiction over the actual water itself. Um, the state would own the underlying river bed. The state owns and makes management decisions about the banks of the river. Um, the federal government has the right to navigation servitude and can construct things like dams in the river system. And then tribes might have treaty rights that guarantee fishing access and unobstructed flow of waters. And there might be also concurrent tribal and federal jurisdiction. So um, that system, which has proven to be fairly dysfunctional, has resulted in a lot of litigation, a lot of stalemate, a lot of um, terrible things for ecosystems like, you know, the river systems in the Pacific Northwest just have dam after dam after dam. And it, you know, all of that is a remnant of the hydropower era and it's had these horrible consequences for um, the ecosystems and the species that live there. Um, also, the jurisdictional model really doesn't take into consideration any indigenous input, except to the extent that a federal court might force um, the states or the federal government to listen to the tribal perspective and to incorporate that. But even still, there's so much hostility between tribes and states in some of these um, regions of the country that the states will really only do what the court is telling them to do and no more. So it's sort of an antagonistic and a hostile relationship even when the courts have forced tribes and states um, into these um, co-management um, models. So the ecological model would be sort of what we're talking about, what many of the panelists have been talking about here, which is a more holistic model that views the ecosystem as a whole and says, um, let's get all of the stakeholders um, who have legal rights um, to make decisions about this system, including perhaps the system itself. So we've heard about you know, rivers having um, constitutional and, and legal rights um, and, and bring those stakeholders together so that the ecosystem can be assessed from a holistic perspective. Um, what actual form that might take is sort of the ultimate challenge for my paper. And, and so what I'm exploring now is different existing models and then um, a potential um, future model that has yet to be um, <coughs> developed. So the second part of my talk is the advantages of the ecological model. I think that other people have probably covered a lot of these advantages, but obviously it's better to look at an ecosystem as a whole when making um, decisions about its health, its future, uh, rather than looking at the individual components. So we've seen a lot of damage done from looking at natural resources as individual um, delineated um, the boxes that, again, were depicted in the previous presentation. Um, so um, also um, from the indigenous perspective, um, the ecological model respects treaty rights rather than ignoring them or violating them. So um, treaty rights to take fish, um, for example, from rivers um, and treaty rights to hunt on certain areas of land would be folded into this ecological model and the tribes would have um, their treaty rights respected by the federal government versus um, having them ignored or violated. Um, the ecological model might lead to less litigation. So we've seen some evidence that um, cooperative and collaborative decision-making processes tend to lead to less litigation. And so there might be less of a fight afterwards about how these decisions are made if the stakeholders are brought in earlier in the process and, and are allowed to sort of shape the, the um, management and decision-making structure and then actually make the decisions. 
Um, also, um, probably the most important point of my talk is that indigenous knowledge about ecosystems is often the oldest and the most accurate knowledge and information that <clears throat> that we have. And so, time and again, you know, I hear stories just anecdotally about um, oral histories that are passed down in certain tribes. About the most recent one was this geological phenomenon in the Pacific Northwest with the tectonic plates, and there were tribes in the Northwest that had talked about how. You know, these stories have been passed down about um, tectonic plates and a tsunami that was a result of this, um, this two plates crashing together. And some of you may have heard about that. And yes, right. And so we see, yeah, in California off the coast. Um, so anyway, we see time and again that um, oral histories, which are often in, under U.S. law, these are often sort of dismounted by courts and decision makers. But Sometimes and often that knowledge, if incorporated, is some of the best knowledge that we have about um, different parts of, um, or, or different ecosystems. Um, so the most exciting example in the third part of my talk, I'm sort of racing through this in the interest of saving time, is um, an existing legal structure um, under the Antiquities Act in the United States. That statute was, is one of our oldest um, sort of natural resource statutes. It was passed in 1906 and it allows presidents to unilaterally declare national monuments. And the national monument can be at the size and scale that the president uh, determines is necessary to preserve the um, resources that are located within the monument. So originally this was passed to protect objects of antiquity, but it also um, in the statutory language, it talks about preserving objects of scientific interest. And so um, what presidents such as President Clinton and President Obama have done is to designate um, areas as national monuments, extremely large areas. Um, the most recent, or the one that I'm focusing on, is almost two million acres in southeastern Utah, sort of near the Kaibab Plateau. Um, and um, so the that the Antiquities Act is kind of a vehicle for setting up a co-management structure. And what President Obama did in December was um, he listened to five tribes that were. Um, the, this area of southeastern Utah was part of their aboriginal homeland and the tribes got together um, a consortium and they proposed this um, national monument to President Obama. He agreed to proclaim it and the way that he set up the national monument was that it would be co-managed by these five tribes. So the five tribes and the federal agencies will make all management decisions about this national monument. This is ex an extremely exciting um, example of co-management um, in an existing legal structure. It doesn't require us to invent anything new. We already have the Antiquities Act. Um, and um, so now the challenge, um, because this monument in particular has been targeted by the Trump administration to be abolished, um, and the recommendation of the Secretary of the Interior, which just came out in some leaked documents that were published by the Washington Post and the New York Times, is that the Secretary of Interior is recommending to President Trump that this monument be completely eradicated. So, um, so we're kind of waiting to see what happens with the National Monument. There's no legal authority for Trump to take it away or abolish it, um, but that hasn't stopped President Trump in the past from um, <laughs> doing things um, that he wants to do. Um, if the monument survives the assault by the administration, um, the really, the way that the co-management structure is set up will be the subject of negotiation between the tribes and the federal government. And although there are many, many legal constraints surrounding that, I think it's one of the most um, exciting examples of incorporating indigenous knowledge into, um, into it, there's actually like six or seven different ecosystems. So it's not even one ecosystem, it's, it's multiple different ecosystems. Um, and, and kind of moving the needle a little bit um, in a very specific way um, under US law. So um, I, I feel like I raced through that. And um, I, another example of co-management agreements are the, um, the fishing, the agreements over salmon fishing in the Pacific Northwest. And those have had their challenges and they've had um, some advantages, I think. And I won't go into them because I don't have enough time, but the paper will cover several different examples of, of existing co-management agreements and sort of point out their advantages and disadvantages. And then um, I promise I will come up with some new model of co-management agreement at some point that I will also include in the paper. And if anybody has any ideas about what form that might take or, or how to further move the needle, I would love to hear those uh, in the feedback session. Thank you. Thank you. Um, questions, comments? Oh, just a question or comment.
So uh, the shift that we're talking about here seems in some ways couched as a shift in the model, but we're still very much talking in a kind of scientific paradigm. You see these things resources, or you see these things holistically, and that's a lot of that. What of course co-management and indigenous knowledge introduce is such more in you know, a much more obvious way is the shift in consciousness, the shift in technology and everything. So I guess I have now two questions. Um, one is have you seen any examples of difficulties in including things like oral histories as as knowledge, as, as uh, information that could be relevant to assessing environmental issues? And yeah, the second one is a comment on um, I see something interesting in in the inclusion of treaty rights that say fish and so on in a shifting consciousness, because if we just think about it as a right to take resources, a right to fish, a right to take resources. Um, it's hard to work out how that helps us shift to uh, an ecological focus, but if you think about what a practice of fishing involves, it involves you have to get out there, you have to <coughs> learn how fish live, you have to engage with them as tissue. So it's, it's about sort of embodied relationship, which is part of the consciousness shift, not just the kind of model shift. Yeah. Great questions. Um, uh, so the first, I think the one point that's raised in both of your questions is that there's sort of a, a, a cultural disconnect between the, the two different parties at the negotiating table. So there's the tribal perspective on um, natural resources, as we call them, at being non-tribal member, and, and that's the sort of the cabin sort of categorical jurisdictional approach. Um, and then there's the sort of holistic, cyclical tribal view of natural resources, which is that they are a part of tribal religion, tribal cultural, tribal life, and they're part of a tribe's life cycle. So a lot of these um, sacred places or sacred practices are actually part of a tribal, they're sort of part of the um, the gears that keep the tribal culture alive. Um, so there's there's a lot of bridging of gaps that needs to happen. I think for these um, these agreements to really function at a level that that preserves um, tribal culture as well as preserving um, ecosystems. And I think there are some tensions even there because sometimes you know with tribes that use um, eagle feathers and with the eagles being on the, you know, not eagles, that's a bad example, but yeah, so we've got different species that might be endangered at certain times, and, you know, there's a prohibition under federal law of taking those species, but then tribes need to be able to exercise those practices. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, your first question asked about um, sort of, um, well, I was thinking in response to your first question, which I've now forgotten about um, stalemates that have happened, basically, where there's a structure that's set up and, and you know, the federal government will say, tribes, we invite you to be co-managers of this. Um, so the bison range, um, which is in the middle of the Flathead Reservation in Montana, is what came to mind because that structure was set up in 1994 and there's still a complete stalemate over funding. So basically, the tribe is saying we're not going to we're not going to come to the table. We're not going to put all of our own resources into this agreement if you're not going to agree to fund us. And so, since 1994, there's been this framework in place, and there's actually no management happening. Well, the feds are doing all the federal government is doing all the managing, and the tribe is sort of sitting there waiting for the federal government to agree to fund the tribal biologists and other um, other um, tribal employees who need to be part of that process. So I, yeah, I, there are multiple different hurdles. There are cultural hurdles and, um, you know, uh, and many others. Um, did I sort of answer the question? Okay. There's a question about incorporating um, or, oral histories. Oh, oral yeah. histories, yeah. right. So oral history has been really, um, so at, at a, on a legal level, as you may be aware, oral histories have been completely discounted. So it, when tribes have tried to um, have a voice or inject their own um, their own input into these natural resource management decision-making processes, um, federal courts have said, we don't take oral history as evidence. Um, so there's that sort of legal backdrop, which is that if the federal government gets sued, they know that the courts are going to say we don't consider oral histories. But it doesn't prevent, you know, I think that there can still be a shift um, forward in um, discussions with federal agencies despite that um, backdrop in the um, case law. There's a long history and a broader context of federal Indian affairs relationships. Yeah. 
Right. Yes, and it gets back to the colonial sort of colonial. I I I would argue that we are still in the colonial period in the United States with respect to the relationship between the federal government and the United States. Yeah. 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 The border it appears that the Supreme Court of Canada is much more thoughtful, systematic, and careful. Uh, addressing uh, evolving understandings and issues with emerging students. Say yes or no to that. Sometimes a lot of talk. Well, I mean, the, the, the Chippewa of the Thames case, I mean, when, I, when I've heard about co management, I had my, one of my most horrible experiences. Um, in, the, in the US government was, was defending the Forest Service against the Klamath tribes. Um, oh, yeah. On some timber sales under the 1995 Rescissions Act, it, 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 where the Forest Service just sold these sales because they were supposed to do it within 45 days after the act, and 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 the language of it said, notwithstanding any other provision of law, um, the Forest Service shall sell these sales, and <clears throat> the tribes got actually a an Earth Justice former Sierra Club legal defense lawyer, so they kind of like their 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 goals matched. Um, and they said that language does not apply to, to treat Indian treaties. And they were absolutely right. I mean, I, I, the, the lawyer and I were working on it, it's like, well, this is a slam dunk. And then they, they said, well, um, you know, there was this kind of quasi co-management type, type of arrangement because this for, Klamath National Forest used to be the Klamath Reservation and the, the tribe disbanded and now they were, they were trying to get re-recognized. It, 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 it was just awful. But, the, the whole thing about you know, the, is co-management or consultation, does it require agreement before there's some kind of action? And, and, and I mean, the Supreme Court, uh, I think said in the, in the Triple the Tense case that came out a month or so ago, that there's no, you know, there's no, it, it doesn't require agreement. Mm -hmm. It requires meaningful consultation, but the final decision goes to, to, to the government. It and has to be under under federal law. The, the federal agency has to be the ultimate decision maker, which is perhaps the biggest obstacle to this being meaningful for tribes. Right, right. well, that's yeah, that's what I was sort of, yeah. sort of getting yeah. at. And that's not really co-management. No. It's co-management asterisks, kind of. Right. Yeah. But that's the nature of the state. I mean, it's state sovereignty. I mean, yes. no way they're going to compromise. The superior that. sovereign and the dependent yeah. sovereign. Yeah. Um, and it's not a question, it's a more uh, demand for uh, uh, explanation. I don't know uh, what happened with this pipeline uh, fight we had uh, mm -hmm. recently. Wasn't it a, a successful history about the... A successful, I'm sorry? Uh, history about uh, the, 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 the natives uh, and the, the environmental uh, problems by uh, yeah. yeah. Well, it was a success, I would say, in raising awareness about tribal rights in, um, you know, tribal treaty rights and the importance of um, consultation with tribes. But it, I mean, the, the pipe, oh, you mean the, uh, sorry, I was thinking Dakota Access Pipeline, but are you, which? Canada. Yeah. Oh, oh, no, I shouldn't talk about Trans Canada Pipeline. It's not my. Well, I think because uh, I've been involved in that uh, by saying it was environmental law, and I think, yeah, indigenous people uh, protested against the pipeline, and TransCanada decided not to build the pipeline, but I think in the end it's not because of the legal arguments yeah. that were brought up. It, yeah, it was a financial decision. So indigenous people were happy in environmental groups as well, but it was a partial win because uh, they, one of the obstacles that they had is that uh, the Quebec Centre was asking TransCanada to, uh, to submit to the provincial legal regulations. So uh, Quebec environmental impact assessment, etc. And so that was an obstacle. But in the end, what I think was decisive is the financial argument. So it's a partial win. Yeah. But there's another uh, west to east pipeline, which is line nine. And that was the one that was the one that the Chippewa of the Thames case uh, dealt with. And, and they had raised the objection, well, you've never really adequately in the history of that pipeline, it's an existing pipeline where they wanted to re reverse the flow. And so they, they raised the duty, of, duty to consult issue. And that's when the Supreme Court said, well, there, of course, there is that duty. It must be meaningful, blah, blah, blah. I don't know the details, but it does not mean 
um, that there must be agreement on both sides before that decision about, about that pipeline. Can Those cases, of course, contain the phrase that somehow minimizes differences across the border, and that is the honor of the crown. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't want to ask The duty to consult the I was just thinking about uh, your question about uh, considering overall history, and I don't know if you've heard about Tessie Goodman's project. She's a professor here currently here in biology, I think. So, yeah, kind of like everything. So she's a resource for a lot of things in environment, and she is a, uh, she has a project where she wants to consult indigenous communities in Canada uh, to see what are their ways to manage and to adapt to climate change right. so that we can learn from them uh, because of their very specific and intimate relationship with nature, with nature. and yeah she was uh, she had this idea of also maybe including legal questions uh, to, to know more about their ways and their rules applying to, to the environment and often the example I've seen, I've not seen it a lot but often it looks like a, an earth charter so their rules are really related to nature, and, and so I think that that would be very interesting. That the way she's planning to do it is to speak with the elders and learn from their history. So, what's your name? Catherine Kotovic. Catherine. P O T V I N. Yes. Okay. How do you spell the last name? P O T V I N. P O T V I N. P -O -T -V -I -N. P-O-T. Oh, P-O-T. Thank you very much. Thank you.